So, you know we have to kick it off with some Huawei news, and it's just imperative at this point. It's like, there's so much to talk about and so much happening. It's not slowing down. This issue, this news story, so significant, far-reaching, reaching into different areas, spectrums, regular people affected, politics, tech. It's so comprehensive. I mean, we're only scratching the surface. We've talked about it on numerous occasions now, and there's still new stuff coming up. In fact, recently, the CEO of Huawei has done all these interviews. He's been, uh, I think he had Time Magazine. He had Bloomberg out there. A lot of people visiting the HQ for Huawei to, to hear what the CEO has to say about this ban. He's got the, he's, he's, you know, apparently prior to this, he was relatively reclusive. And then at one point, fairly recently, he was complimentary of Trump. Not so much anymore for obvious reasons. But the story I want to kick off today's episode with is one that can potentially affect users, you guys, people who watch this type of video, and owners of Huawei products. Huawei price shock. Value of flagship. $1,150 P30 Pro comes crashing down. That's the news story. It's on Forbes. Now, they don't mean crashing down the way you might think from a retail perspective, but instead, secondary marketplace. There are a number of websites out there that will give you value for your previous generation smartphone or even your current gen smartphone that you might want to trade in for something different. So this news story is in relationship to a popular UK trade insight, the UK's most popular smartphone trade insight, or one of them, has a weird name though. What is it called? Music Magpie, Will? I don't know if it's one of the biggest. Maybe Forbes is reaching here. But anyhow, their prices generally would be relative to the marketplace. In other words, whatever it is they can turn around and sell for and then still maintain a margin of profit for themselves so a quick example on their site right now, they've got the P30 Pro 128 GB and the offer price is 100 British pounds. To put that in relationship, an S10 Plus is at 510 British pounds. When you do the conversion, that's uh, 650 USD versus 130 USD. So not, not looking good. If you are the owner of one of these devices looking to sell it to get into something else, maybe you're panicking based on this news. And so therefore, these devices could be hitting the secondary market at a pace greater than the demand to purchase them. Otherwise, this particular company, this reseller site, wouldn't have much of a reason to discount their purchase price. If they thought they could turn around and sell these devices for a reasonable sum of money, they would obviously offer more. In fact, many of these sites actually have a dynamic background kind of a, a system for determining the value of devices in which the sale prices would then reflect on the purchase prices and so forth. So I don't think that they have any other kind of agenda here at play, but it's got to be a little bit nerve wracking for uh, an owner of one of these devices, especially if you recently spent a bunch of money on one of these and the uncertainty going forward of, whether or not or how this device is going to continue to operate considering its reliance on certain services from companies like Google. So this is one of those areas in which, as a regular user, this news, these politics, this situation is now bleeding into your regular everyday life in an unexpected way. Now, do I think this is right? Do I think that uh, you should only be offered $130 for your brand new P30 Pro? No, of course not. And I think... If you can pick one up for that price, you should buy one because as of right now, it still works. And as far as I can tell, Google is going to continue to service this device as if it were any other Android device. So yeah, let's check. What is this same website even selling the device for? So you say they still, still, they still want 629.99 British pounds unlocked. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's not reflected in their sale price yet, this new purchase price. Maybe they don't want any more in their inventory at this at this point in time. So who, who really knows? But even that is still below, I guess, the original retail price. Either way, 
I think we're probably going to see more of this because a lot like the stock market, much of the value of a particular device is based on sentiment at any given point in time. If the sentiment changes, so does the retail value. If, if, if the sentiment changes, so does what people are willing to pay for a device. Here's Will bringing up eBay to get some, some current prices. What you oh, would Amazon. have to do here, Will, is you would have to bring up the... You'd have to go to a more advanced search and look for actual sales as opposed to list prices because these are just buy it now type of listings in which they just sit there for a while as opposed to actual sales that have taken place. They can really ask whatever they want. So if you go to ebay.com and you do a search for P30 Pro, you could just do P30 Pro to keep it simple and get more results. Yeah, if you do this search right here and then you head over to the left-hand side, the sidebar there, scroll down, you will see that you can look at completed listings. Keep going. Keep going. Keep show only sold items. There you go. Sold items right there. Now we'll see actual sale prices for these devices. And you're going to at some point have to select just the phones rather than the accessories as well. This is riveting content right here as Will learns how to use eBay. It's what is the internet? Yeah. yeah, you would have to go to cell phones and smartphones in a category on the left there as opposed to accessories. Yeah, right there. And now you'll see. Okay, so here we go. So there have been recent purchases. There's an auction, in fact, at 880 USD. So a slight discount, but nothing significant. So maybe this particular website is jumping the gun. But there's a, I would not recommend you use it in this case because we have actual active sales on ebay.com showing much higher price points so even if you're in the uk get over it jump on ebay ship it worldwide and and save some cash maybe this particular site is trying to target fearful customers people who are like oh my god i gotta get out of this phone rapidly i'm scared i'll take your hundred british pounds instead of putting it on ebay myself don't do that you could be a target but anyhow, like I said, real world effects, there is an impact. Uh, there's the potential for impact if the sentiment changes. And it's, as you can tell, beginning to change, at least in some departments. The public sentiment, the actual eBay sentiment, which re is a reflection of what the public is willing to bear from a marketplace perspective, not quite changed so much. Scroll down a little bit more. Let's see if we can find a cheaper purchase. Oh, there's a 500 bucks right there. One bid. So... That person got a better deal, in my opinion. But the average somewhere between seven and eight hundred, I'm guessing. Scroll down more, Will. Let's get a nice glimpse here. 735, 624, 650. So secondary market, hard to tell. Of course, each one of these listings is going to be unique in its location, uh, the condition of the device, if the box was opened and whatnot. But I think it's still pretty healthy, the public sentiment on the U.S. eBay. That should tell you something. Now, granted, one thing to keep in mind, this device not super easy to get in the U.S. You can't get it from every corner, uh, you know, cor corner cell phone shop out there. You're kind of stuck having to grab it off of a place like eBay because Verizon, AT&T, they don't sell it natively. So that's worth keeping in mind too when it comes to this public sentiment idea. But anyhow, yes, in this one particular case, the price crashed down. And uh, should you be concerned? As an owner, I'd say hold on to your device. I mean, it still works as of right now. No need to panic. Definitely don't take 100 pounds for it. But there are going to be these vultures out there trying to take advantage of situations like this. On Staying on the topic of Huawei and getting back to some of the interviews that were done by the CEO, Ren Shang-Fei, uh, he says he's not going to pick up Donald Trump's phone call. He says he's not interested, <laughs> which I think is funny. I think it's the perfect, perfect thing to say to somebody like, like Trump. He's like, what do you mean you're not going to pick up my phone call? Uh, he, he, he's not the type of guy that's used to having his phone call not picked up. Uh, he admits that U.S. sanctions are going to cut into Huawei's 5G lead, which has taken a very long time to accumulate. Uh, and and, and uh, the assumption, of course, should be that they've invested a lot of money, not just effort, not just time, not just energy, but money as well into getting this lead. 
again, quick breakdown on the telco market when it comes to these types of cell components that will be inside of your network. There's not that many players capable of delivering 5G or cell towers, the equipment that's in them in general. You've got uh, Huawei, who's of course been covered. Then there's Ericsson and Nokia as well. The, those, are, those two companies, of course, no longer major players in the smartphone-specific space. Uh, I haven't seen those, those brand names in a little while. But nonetheless, still major footprints in the equipment that goes into cell networks. Now, those, con those companies uh, based in countries, of course, with different political connections to the United States, you have Finland and you have Sweden represented there. And it appears that the uh, administration in Washington, Trump, and, and presumably the FBI, NSA, and so forth, are far more comfortable with the network infrastructure of the U.S. being based on Ericsson products or Nokia products, pr probably to do with the fact that the political structure of how those countries interact is more in line with what they're used to or what they're comfortable with. So, uh, But anyhow, th their products... Uh, based on what I, based on my research, are more expensive when delivering the same thing, and that's kind of the difficulty in utilizing their products for this 5G rollout, which is going to have to replace a ton of equipment across networks in North America for T-Mobile, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon. You've also got U.S. Cellular listed there. In fact, networks all across the world that are interested in transitioning to 5G are going to be look, looking for cost-effective solutions. And as of, right, as, as of right now, Huawei is that only cost-effective solution. In fact, uh, one of the first places that's going to be hit by this ban directly is rural United States. The Huawei ban threatens wireless service in rural areas. I've got an article here from the New York Times. Uh, obviously, if you live in an urban setting, you're probably not faced too frequently with a lack of reception. You probably can make a call and access data anywhere that you are. You probably take it for granted. In the rural areas of the United States, it's a big country. There's a lot of people out in, in farmland, basically. And they were already lacking service, so much so that the government had issued subsidies in order to improve service to these citizens that are in these areas. Those subsidies were then used by these small operators to put in new equipment into these regions. But those small operators on this kind of uh, slim budget had no choice but to use Huawei products, surprisingly enough. So this particular article, it details the struggle that's gonna take place for these regional providers, and we talked about this on previous episodes, to offer up their services without access to these products. And in the case study in this particular article specifically, They've been making promises, these regional telcos, for a while to improve services to their customers. But those promises were based on the costs associated with a rollout con continuing to use Huawei products to improve that coverage through more antennas and so forth. And now those promises probably can't be met if these companies are not only forced, by the way, to buy new products from companies other than Huawei, but also should go back and replace the products that they already have within their, within their network that are currently branded Huawei and providing the services that these people, that these people have. So it's a really complicated situation. And it's another one, it's another region in which the effect is, is kind of a, a consequence, maybe an unexpected or an, an underreported consequence of this type of policy that, that came from the administration. Uh, because in this particular case, like here's a, a group of people that's under service to begin with, where they're, they, they, they may actually, the companies they rely on for their telecommunications may actually go out of business. They may actually lose their connections in these regions if this equipment goes offline. Now you might say, well, then the big providers could go in there. Well, what this does is it sort of consolidates power. It means only a handful of carriers are going to be able to play because only a handful of carriers will be able to afford the equipment costs coming from companies other than Huawei. So you might be sitting around waiting a long time for a company as well, like Huawei or Verizon, to care enough 
with the size of the, the market that they're already responsible for, cash and checks for, do they really want to go into the average uh, Montana farm, northeast Montana farm, that, you know, to get a couple more customers? See, the reason this is so difficult is because these are vast landscapes with a limited number of people. So a big company might not care that much. A regional company can go in there and put, put the work in to gather up these customers, potentially. Mr. Kilgore chose Huawei, which offered to customize its equipment and charge 20 to 30% less than competitors. That, of course, is the uh, spokesperson, the owner, I suppose, of one of these regional networks. Which regional network is his, Will? Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's up there somewhere. Anyhow, point being is Nemont is the name of the carrier. I mean, I don't even... Is there a chance that anyone watching the show is a customer of Nemont, the wireless carrier, or Nemont, however it's pronounced? Probably not, but these carriers are out there somehow. And apparently within these carriers, Huawei is currently installed uh, f uh, for about 25% of the equipment within these networks. Who would have known? Again, I'm, I am not personally in a rural environment. I'm in the Toronto area here, and it's like, it's only a select group of carriers. Three, basically, that provide almost everybody's services. So this is very different in the United States, as you can tell. And there are underserviced regions which were benefiting, in a way, from this affordable Huawei equipment. Now, in the presence of a ban like this, if this is to persist, there's gonna, they're going to have to figure out other ways, and it's going to cost more money, obviously. If uh, for these people to maintain services, maybe the government subsidies have to go up even greater. Who really knows? It's, uh, it's another layer in this very complicated sandwich that we're currently dealing with. All right, switching topics from Huawei. Uh, there's a new Razer Blade laptop, Will, and it's not aimed at gamers. So how about that? Razer is going after the creative class, guys like yourself, Will with the Razer Blade Studio Edition. And this is for guys like you, it's for guys like Kirk, and guys like Jack, MacBook Pro users. Look at that thing, doesn't it look like a MacBook Pro? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a good move, to be honest. There's not a lot of options in this space with this very specific target. And there's a ton of dissatisfied MacBook users, MacBook Pro users, because, man, it seems like I can't get away from the articles talking about the keyboard issues and and uh, the lack of, I mean, it hasn't been modernized all that much. The screen still has a giant bezel on it. Uh, anyhow, obviously the fan base for MacBook Pros is always going to be out there, but here's an alternative in the Windows space aiming to mimic the MacBook Pro experience, but while including NVIDIA's Quadro graphics. So it'll have the RTX 5000 mobile GPU. This is targeted at creative professionals, specifically targeted at creative software in the content creation space. So it should be optimized for Adobe's suite and various other software that people would use to create content, 2D, 3D content, video editing, Photoshop, all this kind of stuff, all this good stuff. So they're gonna make a 15 inch version with a 4K OLED display, that's pretty cool. And then a 17 inch version as well with a 4K 120 Hertz display. Of course, you can get the i9 processors in there and the RTX 5000 mobile GPU that I just mentioned. So an interesting play from, from Razer. I feel like somebody should have occupied this space. Uh, you switch over to the Windows side. And if you're in the content creation space, you either go for something that looks kind of boring like this, if you're into it, doesn't bother me that much. Or you've got something that looks like a gaming computer, which is kind of weird, a weird thing to bring to like a boardroom meeting, you know? It's a... It's, uh, there was a bit of a gap there, and I guess this is aiming to fill that gap. Now, do you feel like the visual language here is too too much MacBook? Mm -hmm. Will, is it too much of a knockoff, or do you feel like it's unique? I think it is, like the black bezels and like the silver kind of look. So Although, that maybe the lighter keys save it in a way. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, it does have like a different accent color with the keys. I don't know. Um I mean, the front of it kind of looks like a MacBook too, with just the logo, mm -hmm. the Razer logo. I mean, there's not much differentiation, but uh, 
I mean, it's hard at this point. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard. What is it? You it's got really black, hard. you got silver. What can you really do? Where can you go? Everything's been done. It's hard. It's a hard comparison to make. But this is obviously less MacBook than the Mate book. Yeah. Which we, right. which we showcased on the previous version, which is like, it looks like a direct kind of knockoff, obviously. But again, even in that department, people were like, people were very happy about it because that's what they wanted. It turns out people wanted a Windows MacBook knockoff. But, but I do agree with you. The Razer Studio product is a bit more of its own thing and an interesting development from a company that previously pretty much only was only synonymous with gaming uh, related stuff. And so I think this is a good move. Now, the question for me, I'm hoping, I'm hoping of course, to get my hands on this. The question for me is going to be about the keyboard because I'm always talking about keyboards. People are probably sick of it at this point, but I got to have a nice keyboard and I'm very critical of keyboards on laptops. So We'll see how that one shakes out and whether or not it's a compelling package for me. But I could see myself being interested in this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Coming in the fall. Coming in the fall. It's pretty close. It's all going to happen. All right, so there's a bit of a WhatsApp thing going on. Uh, we, talked in, we talked recently about a hack that, that happened with WhatsApp. Uh, this one, not a hack, but uh, another controversy relating to ads. So anyone who's familiar with WhatsApp, it's been like this wildly successful messaging app, obviously, 1.5 billion users, Facebook bought them. People were constantly wondering, like, what is the monetization strategy here? How is WhatsApp going to make money? It's this very important app for a lot of people. And I believe they had a premium. You could pay a little bit for like a premium account at one time. Was that a thing in WhatsApp? Was there a pay, pay to play option for extra features? Yeah, I remember paying one dollar. It was for like it. one dollar per year. It was it was pretty insignificant. Well, obviously now that it's owned by Facebook, that's not enough. We're gonna need a few more bucks there, Kirk. A few more dollars. We're Facebook, you know. Advertising. You can't really blame them. Everybody's. I mean, they gotta find a monetization strategy. But any anyhow, people are not super happy about it. WhatsApp is an important utility for a lot of people. And these ads are going to launch in 2020. They're going to be status ads. So that's WhatsApp's stories. What app doesn't have stories these days, by the way? It's getting out of hand. Anyway, so the ads are going to be inside of WhatsApp status stories. And they showed off what that's going to look like. And some people found it to be offensive. Many users, in fact, saying they're going to switch apps, switch to Telegram, why the heck does Facebook think this is a good idea? People use WhatsApp for professional contacts and Facebook for pleasure. So these are comments from Twitter users, and they're not happy. I don't want ads. I'd rather pay $50 a year to use it ad-free. Same as always, idiots. Wow, people are so angry, aren't they? Well, holy moly. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's... What can you do? This, is, this seems to be part of the maturation process of almost any app, of almost any user basis. They're like, okay, now that you love it, we got to monetize. And this is the de facto monetization standard. People, people say they want to pay for services online, and that is changing recently. People are changing their behaviors around that. They're paying a few bucks for things they really like. But the majority of online audiences are still paying through their attention in the form of ads. And there's very little way it appears to get around that. If you want good things, you gotta pay one way or the other. So anyway, you may have a point to the angry person on Twitter here. If they, maybe they should offer 50 bucks a year for, that, for those type of users. And maybe they do very well with that. That could be an option. It would be a cool idea in general for social media. Instagram could have something like that, Facebook, uh, Twitter, an ad-free version that you pay for. It, it would be interesting to see how many people would actually take advantage of that or how many would choose to put up with ads. Anyhow, ads are coming to your WhatsApp, so get ready for it. All right, this is my last one of the day, Will, and then I'm handing over the reins to you. Book your name for the next Mars rover. So we talked in the past about potentially traveling to Mars. I was like, nah, I'm good because I know you can't come back, and I'm like... I'm enjoying myself here, Will. I don't know if you can tell. I'm enjoying myself. So I don't, I can't be going somewhere and not coming back. I got a limited amount of time already to work with. It's a cool idea, but like what's on Mars? Can I bring people with me? Uh, do, do I, uh, can I get a bite to eat and whatnot? 
So this isn't a cool kind of uh, alternative. You don't actually have to go to Mars. You can just book your name on the rover. So there's this cool thing. They're going to etch a bunch of people's names onto a chip, like very small etching. And you're going to get this boarding pass to say that, hey, you were a part of it. You can register right now. And it's a limited number of people. And you may be selected, maybe not. There's a web page for it. NASA's doing it. And uh, it's pretty cool. So these, those happy souls whose applications are accepted will receive a souvenir boarding pass and frequent flyer points. And there's a lot of room on the two or more chips under the glass. A micro device lab of jet propulsion technology will use an electron beam to stencil the names in microscopic size. So apparently they're going to get like a million names on there. And even, even though you're not on Mars, Will, your name... Do they already have 5 million? It seems like it. Oh, they already got 5 million names. 5.5 million. So you have a, right now, you have a one in five chance of getting your name on there. If they're going to, if it's going to be randomly selected, which is what it seems like is what they're going to do. Worth it. That's not bad. One yeah. in five chance right now. You, all you gotta do is type your name in and, uh, and you could be like, look, my name's on Mars. I mean, that's some pretty cool bragging rights. Plus you get the, you get the little uh, voucher, the boarding pass as proof. To, to tell everyone that, that you did it. I don't know. It's a cool little thing. If you're a space fan, science fan, you can go over there. It's free to do. So I find that to be to be pretty cool. Willie Do, you, you're not on Mars, but your name is. Mm -hmm. Etched microscopically. And who knows how long that, that lasts up there. Maybe the uh, aliens in the future, they find it. They think about Willie Do. They're like, he was a guy. And, and they put a smile on their face. Would you go to Mars if uh, you had a chance to come no, back? No, we talked to... Oh, if I had a chance to come back? Yeah. For like... Uh, if they could guarantee I'd come back? Three months. Three months, eh? How long did it take to get there? I don't think that makes any sense. I don't think it works. The math doesn't work. I don't well, know. okay, like you travel, but you stay there for three months. So it's like a year then, right? The the Sure. It's probably yeah. like a year. I can't give up a year, Will. Six years there and back. Six years? Oh, my goodness. Whatever it is, man. It's too much. Whatever it is. I got people. I got a life. Yeah, you got priorities. I got priorities. I hear you. I can't do it. You could. If I bring Otis, yeah. You and Otis? I mean, we'd miss you. We couldn't replace you. You can't man. go. What Just send me the footage so I can do thumbnails. Like Okay, all right. In the space if we station. can communicate, you know, imagine <laughs> you, could, you could produce the show. You'd be sitting there, produce the show from Mars. Yeah. Really do. I don't think it works. I don't think the math works out on this. And I don't think the people want to let you go, to be honest. If you're out there in the audience, let us know. Mm -hmm. Can we make do without Willie do? I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. All right, what do you have today, Will? You got a story you want uh, to talk about? Just a quick one. Quick one, okay. So 71% of college students prefer Macs over PCs, hmm. according to a survey here hmm. by Jam F. Hmm. And um, yeah, there's a little chart here. Um, 40% um, of students use a Mac and 31% use PC but prefer a Mac. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the 29% use and prefer a PC. And this study was done uh, with, I think, over 2,000 students um, across five countries. Wow. Pretty big, pretty big sample size. This doesn't surprise me. Well, you know, Apple, aspirational brand. You know, everybody in, in university, they're trying to, uh, you know, status, yeah, social connections. There's something about it where once a brand is associated with affluence or success or the cool thing, it's like, I got to have one of those as well. I think Apple benefits greatly from that perception. The Apple store, Starbucks, Brand recognition, essentially. Uh, do people really... I mean, I, the, the popularity of the iPhone as well, if you think about it, right? On college campuses, especially in the US, North America. It's like you get used to having that brand. You like your iPhone. So what, should, what laptop should you have? I mean, unless you have a particular application that you can't install on Mac or something like that. That's what I mean. I think like all, a lot of universities and colleges, they use PCs. Like in their libraries right. and in their classrooms and stuff. Right. But, but compatibility's gotten a lot better. That's true. So now that's it's not, true. you're not left out there. 
you can you can do most things cross platform. So to me, this is understandable. Yeah, but it's still going to be way more expensive than a PC equivalent. But uh, I, uh, a lot of students, you know, they they think that the Mac is more modern and intuitive and reliable. Yeah, they think it's the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So see that that makes sense to me. I mean, it's look, it's. When you think of a product, you think of what you want, you think of what's good and what's bad. There's a lot of it that comes from personal experience, but we all have limited personal experiences. I mean, you just can't try everything, have everything. On the graph that you showcased before, you said 31% have a PC, but think they would prefer a Mac. Like, what are they basing that on? Have they used a friends? Is it personal experience or is it perception? And so much of how we buy things is our perception of what's better. Like, oh, that seems like a high quality thing. And that's where brand recognition comes into play. And it's not just specific to technology. It's all over the place. Like who decided that X brand was the prestigious brand? Was it a, strictly a history of delivering the best products or are there other components at play? I think it's a bit of both. There's a history of delivering products. There's marketing. There's, there's a lot that goes into perception. So I'm not surprised by this number. I think Mac for the most part is a very approachable, aspirational brand, a well-received brand. And therefore, it's easy for me to understand why people would choose it or want it. Now, the one area where I'll say that's that, that kind of flips is with gamers. On the flip side, when it comes to gamers, they wouldn't be caught dead with a Mac. Yeah, 100%. They're like, I can't do anything on that. I don't, that's uh, not representative of me in any, in any way, shape or form. So if you scroll back up, I mean, use and prefer PC, those 29%, there's a high percentage chance they play some games. Yeah. So maybe the way that these groups are split has more to do with their lifestyle choices as, or, or a, big part, a big part of it could be how they perceive themselves, their lifestyle, um, where they fit demographically. It could be a lot of pieces at play here. But anyhow, I'm not surprised. Go to a college campus. I think there's a famous picture, Will. Type college campus, Apple, something like this, Apple laptops, and then go to Google image search. And you can see there's, I, I believe there's a couple images where like everybody in the auditorium, maybe type auditorium as well. Let's see if we could track this down real quick. Yeah. Look at that picture. It's dark, so it's hard to see. But in here, you could just see all the glowing Apple logos. It's a bit of a dated picture because of course the Apple logo doesn't glow anymore. But would you look at that? This is how things work. You know, I was driving down the street the other day, Will, and I see a group of high school students. They're all wearing the same stuff. They're wearing the same clothes, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's because once something has been perceived as accepted, it's like, I don't want to. I need everybody to know. I see what's going on. I see what's right and wrong. I see what's acceptable. You know, it's hard to, to make some choice that's independent of what the group is doing. Because then you're out, you, you're, you're, you're outcast, not in the sense that like everyone's like, get out of here, but you're outcast in the sense that you're like, I'm making a different choice than what everybody else is making. And, we, and you, everyone had that experience. There's only so many people in high school, for example, or college that are willing to stand out like that. Most people, they're going to they're gonna fit within the protocol because that's safe. It's like, look, I'm one of you. Don't look at me. I'm not a target. I'm one of you. I'm just like you. The same laptop, same hairstyle. Same outfit, drive the same car, eat the same food. You know, it's a safety move. And human beings, is how we operate. So, and it's also a good way, in fact, for the thing, whole thing to govern itself. Because, like, let's be honest. If the product was complete garbage, it wouldn't, let, it wouldn't work for very long. You know, at least that's the hope. But anyhow, I'm not surprised. A lot of Macs on college campuses. But shout out to the gamers at the bottom there. 29% <laughs> use and prefer PCs. Shout out. You know, they deserve it too. Right? Anyway, you got some questions for us today, Will. Maybe a couple. Holy smokes. You got a lot of questions there? I don't know if we're going to get to all of them. Uh, we'll, we'll work with three. We're going to work. We're going to work with three. Okay, fine. Hey, Lou, Will. By the way, love the Willie do Nick. What's that? Nickname, I guess. Oh. Yeah. Is, is your real name, though? It's not much of a nickname. Like, he is actually Willie Do, just in case you're wondering. I mean, it's D-U, but he's, it's still Willie Do, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. 
Uh, Lou, you have had some watches through the years. What's your favorite, and what is the one you're using now? Oh, this is, this is highly requested. This question so comes up people. way too often, doesn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I was I wore Casio watches like G-Shocks forever since I was a kid. In fact, I love a like a durable watch. I don't have to worry about or think about too much. I had one fancy watch at one point in my life because I thought it was cool. It was a Seiko. And I remember they had the commercials on the TV with the auto relay where it was, it could remember the time, even if you didn't use it for a while, you would put it back on and it would spin back to the right time, even though it was a, um, an analog watch. Anyhow, I had one of those one time, I beat it up too much. I was like, nah, I can't be having, and this was, a, I, I guess I might've been in high school at the time. And so I went back to the stuff I had worn as a kid, which was G-Shock watches, these really durable things that you, you can, like I said, beat up. If you scratch it against the countertop, you just don't care. These things are meant for that. And then smart watches came along and I liked them to a differing degree from time to time. I would go through phases of wearing them. Then I realized I got to cut back on notifications in general. Like, now again, this might be unique to me compared to the average person, but like I could, if I wanted, if I had everything turned on, I could be getting so many notifications that my life would be in jeopardy, my regular everyday life. Like, and I guess a lot of people are kind of in that territory these days. Comes to uh, email and social media and whatnot. You could really be disrupted a lot. And it's one thing to be disrupted in the pocket. You can kind of ignore it and get back to your daily activities. But to be disrupted on the wrist is a whole different ballgame because that's like a public piece of real estate. If you're out to dinner with a loved one or something and that thing is popping off, even at the kitchen table at home, with your family around and that thing is popping off. It's like, look, I'm so important. You know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough pitch. Now I understand, do not disturb. I've been on do not disturb now for a while on the phone as well, trying to cut back notifications. But once you turn the notifications off of a smartwatch, the functionality becomes fairly limited after that. So anyhow, I, at some point switched to this one, which is a smartwatch, but I'm not really using it much as a smartwatch. It's a Polar Vantage Polar Vantage, and they make two versions of it. Mine's the M. The V is a bit heavier, and it has a couple more features, but I actually wanted something fairly lightweight. This is somewhere between the two. It's sort of smart, but it's also pretty pretty durable and rugged, and I'm, I'm not a runner or anything like that. I do go on the bike from time to time, so it will keep your heart rate. It will track your fitness, but... I'm not getting any notifications on it. It's connected to my smartphone in a limited fashion. Now, if you're really into training, this could be a very popular choice. I like it for the heart rate monitor here and there every so often. It's got a very effective heart rate monitor. In fact, if I take it off real quick, you can see they redesigned the sensor on this thing completely. It's got these four points. I don't know. Can anyone see this? Yeah, you can see that right there. It's got those four points on it. So in some cases, you would have... Uh, like kind of finicky heart rate monitors on these things. I was like, look, if I'm only going to use it every so often for that function, then then that's an area I would like the thing to be to be decent at. And and that's what this one is. It'll track your steps and your general activity. So like I said, it's got the partial smartwatch functionality. It's not running Android Wear. It's definitely not an Apple Watch. And because of that, the the battery lasts longer as well. Another one of my pet peeves with the moving from like a G-Shock watch to a fully smart watch is now you're charging the thing all the time. With a G-Shock watch, like I used to wear, you never, it has battery forever. Now this one is in between the two in that same department. I charge it, man, not that often. Once a week max, maybe once every two weeks and it charges really fast. And so for me, it's kind of a good balance for right now. It's comfortable to wear and it doesn't hurt that I like the style. And it's so simple, like, it's just a round, you know, it's just a, it's just a round watch. It looks very simple. And when it's turned off, it's just blacked out. So I think many of you probably agree on the style front, which is part of the reason that I've been getting uh, a lot of questions about it, I suppose. So anyway, that's the Vantage M and so far so good. I can't claim that I'm going to be on it forever. I was just looking at G-Shocks yesterday because I was like, I kind of miss them a bit. Those big rugged looking things this one i got some scratches on the screen you can't tell me it's as durable no smartwatch that i've bumped into has been as durable 
as those ones are. Because I'm out there, Will. I'm living life. I'm playing catch. I throw the ball around, you know, the baseball. Uh, I'm out there. I play street hockey from time to time. Like I said, I'll get on. I'll hop on a bike. I might even ride my bike to work. I'm thinking about it. So I'm out there, you know, rock climbing, uh, uh, swimming. You don't know what I'm up to. Yeah, you old, think you know what I'm up to. Old face lie right there. You don't know. You think you know what I'm up to. You don't know what I'm up to. Plus, just when I'm working outdoors, you know, like I was cleaning the garage the other day. Mm. And it's, I'm moving things. I'm banging things. I don't want to be thinking about my fancy watch. I really don't. You scrape it along, you know, your... I was like, re, I was rearranging my tools. I got a new toolbox. So, you know, I just... This is such a... I don't want a fancy watch is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. This location is not a sacred place for me. I'm not trying to put a Rolex. I'm not trying to do all that. It, it, it's cool. Like, I, I understand people appre really appreciate a fine watch. There's a lot that goes into it. Get into those mechanical watches, all the little cogs and whatnot. It's a real art. But that's the kind of thing I would put on a shelf. I would never wear it. I know it. So this is an area where I really appreciate utility, Will. You hear me? Yep. You want to take another question? Hey, Lou and Will, Huawei has sold millions of phones every year. However, it seems Huawei will lose his huge market share and people have to choose their future phones from other companies. What do you think? Which smartphone company will profit the most of Huawei's fall? Which one can replace Huawei? Uh, in, in the immediate sense, Samsung benefits because Huawei's flagships had really been infringing on the Samsung space big time and making up significant market share. Of course, Samsung was number one still uh, in terms of uh, smartphone shipments, but Huawei was catching up. They had passed Apple recently. So I would say there, of course, the other Chinese manufacturers should also benefit because they're not being restricted in any way yet. So Xiaomi, Oppo, OnePlus, these other companies will benefit as well. But in the most major way, likely Samsung. But I've said on this show, I don't think Huawei is going away. I think they're going to find a way, a Huawei. I was, I was going to resist doing that. But you did it earlier, and you've been doing it well. And the, the problem is, you just influenced me. Yeah, and then line. I did it. But anyhow, I think they're going to stick around. Let's go to the next question. Hey, Lou, looking into the future, it seems technology is getting more and more wireless, such as for listening and viewing information. Do you think at some point we will be able to have computers in our own brain? And if so, would you install one? Completely wireless is the subject line. Um, yeah, of course. Embedded technology, certain point. People are going to make the sacrifice in exchange for convenience. That's what we do as human beings. I talked about it before. I'll talk about it again. That's how it goes. Um... It's a funny thought. You know, right now, people are panicking about a Chinese company owning the infrastructure, the uh, network hardware in the United States saying, hey, that could be a target for espionage, for example. Uh, so if people are sensitive about the network hardware that's getting installed in the ground, imagine how much trust you're going to have to embed some real sophisticated communication device in your brain. Now, obviously, we're not at that point yet. People are implanting RFID chips into their bodies already, small, little, rudimentary chips that have limited functionality. But if we're talking real interfacing, can you imagine the paperwork, the restrictions? I mean, how do you govern something like that? Very complicated stuff. So even with all that said, though, I, I'm, I'm sure it will happen. Why? Because that's what human beings do. We do technology. That's what we do eventually. Everything is technology. Well, the fire, the wheel, and now, now this, now smartphones, and next. You're going to have the dude. He's going to show up. He's going to be like doing the calculations in his head. He's going to be doing the, the web searches in real time. You're not even going to see him using anything. You're going to be like, man, how do I be like that guy? He's so quick and talented. And you're just going to accept it. You're going to be like, all right. Maybe you're going to hijack me forever from this point forward, but I got to be like that guy. You know, we, we, we often, it's, it, it sometimes is easier for us to see the novelty, to see the advancement, to see the progress. And it's not until much later that we recognize the drawbacks. Those are more complicated, more sophisticated. It takes a while for us to 
fully understand the potential downside of these things that at first glance seem so amazing to us. So Will's showing off a video right now. He's a big fan of this because I know because you sent this to me before, Will. It's called Hyper Reality. And it's absolutely a really cool kind of, uh, what would you call it? It's like a... Augmented reality It's like short an short story. Yeah, it's like an imaginative narrative point of view video about a, a, a potential futuristic reality, a hyper reality in which augmented reality is constantly augmenting your point of view in order to uh, in order to well sell you things, influence you, but also potentially enhance your experience and uh, and uh, provide you with some degree of novelty. So it's it's cool. It's kind of a dark, gets a bit dark. But you can go watch it. Go check it out for yourself. It's called Hyper Reality. It is cool. It's definitely worth a watch. And it's only about six minutes. So I recommend it. And definitely Willie Do does as well. So yes, to answer your question, it's going to happen. Will I do it? By the time it's really good, I'm probably really old. Hmm. Or at least old-ish. At which point, I'm going to be I'm gonna be so stuck in my ways that I'll be like, get away from me with that. You know what I mean? I'll be like, I'm I'm an old school. I'm a purist. I'm going to be climbing, climbing, doing rock climbing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Since nobody believes me on that one. But you know what I mean? Well, it's like, I, I don't, I don't doubt that it's going to happen, but this is one area where I think I would probably resist only because I don't want to be the absolute beta tester on this one. Right. Do you know what I mean? Even though I'm, I consider myself an early adopter, I'm going to be a little careful on this one. You know? Fair enough. I'm not ready to get hijacked. Hacked. Imagine that. All of a sudden, I'm some different person. Yeah. It's a scary thought, man. Maybe that's exactly what you want, Well. <laughs> I'm good. Anyhow, uh, there you have it. Wonderful time. What a time to be alive. Right, Will? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're just here. We're doing it. We're doing it for you, ultimately. We're, we're trying to give you what you need. And uh, as I've said in the past, we're, we're aiming. We're aiming for the top. You know, the top part, the target, the crosshairs trying to get to the bottom of it. It's hard to do. It's hard to figure it out. It's hard to navigate. And this Huawei thing is a, is a, is a perfect example. It's like such a hard thing to think about. I'm, I sit here and I talk about it. I try to navigate these very muddy waters of like, what is the advice? Like, what can we, how can we proceed in this type of a climate? It's a, it's a really tough one and there's no perfect answer. The apprehension, you can understand it. On the one side, you can understand the other argument, which is like, hey, man, open free markets. There's so many comments coming in about it. I get it. It's tough. It's weird. The world is weird. The future of the world is weird. And that's why we're here. We're going to keep going after it. All right? Trust me. I'm going to go do some rock climbing now. <laughs>